Sorry about the noise in the background. I'm recording this after the fact, but I feel like it's very important to warn you about this story. It is a very good story. It's incredibly well written, and the story itself is engaging and entertaining and just great overall. However, there are a lot of very heavy themes in this story. There is kidnapping, human trafficking, drug abuse, rape, uh, pedophilia, child sexual abuse. It's a lot. So if you feel like you can't handle that kind of thing for the entirety of the story, feel free to sit this one out. There are plenty of other stories on the channel that deal with scary monsters and campfire stories. It's something much less intense than this. So, just wanted to let you know. Enjoy. The Predator casually surveyed his hunting ground. His camouflage consisted of a dry, cleaned white suit, matching silk shirt, and a carefully chosen tie. His sleeves were rolled up just enough to display a fake Rolex, and the graying hair at his temples had been darkened with very cheap and very temporary dye. The same dye darkened his goatee. Beside his Italian leather loafers rested a slim and shiny black briefcase. In the cheap and hotter decor of an American mall, he struck a sophisticated and prosperous contrast, which further accentuated his illusion. Sitting quietly and sipping his coffee as he stalked, a hunter of opportunity, he had no specific prey in mind. If the chance presented itself, he'd pursue. If not, he would slink away empty-handed, as he most often did. Even nature's greatest predator, the tiger, was only successful on one out of seven hunts. He freely admitted a much worse ratio than that, but caution was his code, and a successful hunting trip was one safely returned from. A lost opportunity was unfortunate, and merely so. But detection, capture, and consequences were unthinkable. His recent narrow escape in Charlotte was not something he was anxious to repeat. He eyed a group of co-eds as they passed by, barely bothering to conceal his stare. They were certainly cute, but too many. Safety in numbers. Another young pair across the concourse caught his eye. Only two was a good sign. It meant they were out looking for something, boys most likely, available and interested in being approached. Best of all, two could be played against each other. This could be an opening, but not too hasty. First, they needed to be watched. He had to be sure they were alone, that there weren't parents, older siblings, or other members of their clique about to intervene. They turned to the corner, walked across the seer's entrance, and began heading toward him and the food court. His interest was evident as they approached and passed him by, averting their eyes and giggling together. They were both young blondes, thin, dressed to attract attention and wearing too much makeup, the very picture of youthful naivety. It was tempting to take on both, but together they may be too much to handle safely. His lascivious eyes had already developed a preference, but he would not allow himself to be ruled by impulse. Pragmatism and opportunity must govern. He'd first need to observe and determine which was dominant and play on that. He drew his cell phone, set the alarm for 20 minutes, and then rose to pursue his quarry. A sudden discomfort scratched inside his head like an itch against his skull. It was followed by a compulsion which drew his gaze away from the blonde's swaying hips to the other side of the concourse. There, half hidden behind a display, was a girl, her eyes intent on him. When their gazes met, she looked away quickly, but he understood she'd been watching him. Interesting. He quickly reassessed the situation. She seemed to be alone, young, brunette, and dressed in all black. Better and better. He always had a thing for the goth emo look. Perhaps here it was an easier, lower risk and more desirable target. Forgetting the blondes, he moved toward the new opportunity. As he rounded the corner and approached, she came more fully into view. Long dark tresses flowed and framed her angular face, contrasting with her bright green eyes. Makeup accentuated her fair complexion, but her application was subdued, done with taste and skill. Her black t-shirt seemed a size too small and stretched the gruesome visage of demonic Pope across a generous bosom. 
The heavy metal t-shirt was tucked into a pair of skin-tight black jeans adorned with chains and patches, which themselves tucked into a pair of hard-looking boots strung yet with more chains. The projected image was that of a strong and rebellious young girl. The image he received was an overdeveloped and naive creature whose premature independence would be her downfall. He approached her, smiling broadly. Hi, how's it going? He asked. She looked over at him and tearlessly replied, Hi. Skepticism was written across her face, which seemed natural enough. He continued, I noticed you from across the way, gesturing with his head. The fluorescent lighting doesn't harm your complexion much. The what? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a photographer by profession, and sometimes it can be hard to turn off. As he explained, he reached into his inner jacket pocket and deftly offered her a glossy business card. You see, I'm a talent scout and journeyman photographer for Teen Scream magazine. The name's Eric Avagio, he said with an insincere smile. I'm actually prowling about now. Malls are great places to find subjects. The lighting is absolutely terrible. Whenever someone looks halfway human under them, it suggests that they're photogenic. That they photograph well. She took the embossed and elegant card from his outstretched hand. His outward demeanor didn't betray his nerves. His heart was racing and his stomach was twisted in knots. He felt like a kid asking this girl out. He resisted the powerful urge to leer at her body, but instead kept his gaze fixed on her face and eyes. She had such pretty eyes, a deep ocean green that you could almost feel yourself drowning in. There's time enough for that later. Now he needed to maintain control, set the snare. You've heard of Teen Scream, of course, he elicited. Kinda. She didn't talk much, but she was probably just nervous. We're always looking for new talents and new faces. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind joining me for a minute or so. He gestured toward the table he'd been sitting at. We could take a few test shots and see how they come out, maybe discuss the possibilities. Possibilities? Modeling, of course. Haven't you ever wanted to be a model? She replied with a dismissive snort. <laughs> Never really thought about it. Well, you might want to. You can make some quick cash, and who knows, you might blow up and have a career. It won't take long. Say, I'll even buy you a coffee. That was a mistake, he thought. It might come off as too desperate. Time to change topic and distract her. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. She looked at him with her deep green eyes. Violet, she answered. That's different. My daughter has a friend named Violet. She looks nothing like you, though. He never had a daughter. So, Violet, what's with that shirt? He asked as he started walking away. She took the bait and followed him as she explained. She just finished talking when they reached the line at Dunkin' Donuts. It's really interesting. He lied. So, how long have you liked that group? He needed to keep her talking and prattling on. It would set her at ease and make her feel like she had some control. They ordered, paid, and then clearly annoyed the teller by getting a receipt. I can write it off as a business expense, he explained to the clerk. The mention of business shifted the conversation back to terms. As he led Violet to an open table in the food court, he began to spin his practiced web of lies. He explained who he portrayed himself as, that he received a commission for each prospect he brought in, and a bonus if one was actually hired. He didn't want to get her hopes up, but there was always a possibility. Bait and deception. With effort, he kept his eyes glued to hers and did his best to read her. She was a tough one, very impassive. There were times he didn't think she was buying it, but then she would raise her eyebrows, smile, or give some one-word response, something to show that she was still interested. He decided that this one was probably not too bright. It was getting late and it was almost time to spring the trap. He pulled his best lure from his briefcase, an immaculate and lusciously printed 9x11 glossy folder made up to look like the cover of the magazine itself. It even included the name Teen Scream splayed across the top in its distinctive font. 
The cover girl was broadly smiling, a young model wearing a glamorous evening gown and confidently strutting down a catwalk surrounded by photo flashes. The cover line surrounding the image read, Your glamorous career, how to prepare for your first photo shoot, and the ins and outs of professional modeling. Violet took the folder and opened it to find inside flaps filled with bundles of documents, all printed on high-grade bright white paper and prominently bearing the teen scream letterhead. Affixed to the lower inside flap was another of Eric Avagio's business cards, tucked into the specially cut slits. Violet's amazement was reflected in her eyes. His heart leapt. She was taking it all in, hook, line, and sinker. Twenty minutes were up, and the soft tone of his phone alarm wafted over the table. He pulled his phone from inside his jacket, glanced at the screen, and commented, Sorry, I need to take this. He rose, turned off the alarm, and then held the phone to his ear. Charlotte, how's it coming? He said as he walked out of earshot, leaving Violet to nibble his carefully prepared bait. He mocked the conversation from a safe distance for a short time before coming back to the table. Okay. Okay. Well, what can you do? Just be prepared. I'll call you when I'm leaving to let you know. He turned off his phone and placed it back in his pocket. Sorry about that. She didn't respond, flipping pages of the brochure apparently mesmerized by the glamour of it all. He continued. We were supposed to be back in town for another couple of days, but corporate needs us back to do some reshoots. Violet looked up at him, her face as impassive as ever. Look, you seem like a nice kid, and I'd feel guilty if I showed up, offered this great opportunity, and then just disappeared. Besides, I would hate to have wasted the night and not get paid for it. I just talked to Charlotte. She and Bill are back at the studio packing up. If you want, I'll bring you by the studio. We'll take a few headshots, nothing too elaborate, and then we can drop you off back here. It shouldn't take more than an hour or so. Say yes, say yes, say yes. Violet looked at him. Okay, I guess. He smiled as she rose and followed him through the mall towards Sears. The exit, the van, her nightmare, and his dream. He started with a quick apology for leaving so fast. We usually get your hair and makeup done, da da da. But quickly segued the conversation back to her to get her talking. She needed to be distracted, not thinking about the situation, not noticing that she was walking into a trap. Keep asking questions, keep her talking, hide this growing sense of anticipation, lead her along, you're almost there. They exited the mall through the rear exit slash entry for Sears and walked under the dimly illuminated extended carport. This was the hard moment. This was the moment he'd lost the girl in Charlotte. The incongruity of the ugly white windowless van and the posh photographer had been too stark for her. He led Violet around to the passenger side and opened the door for her. She stopped, a look of concern on her face. Cool as ever, he smiled at her. Not what you expected, huh? Well, the camera equipment doesn't fit so well in my bins. Besides, Charlotte, Ben, and I fit comfortably in this. Shit, he'd said Ben instead of Bill. Would she notice? A Ben's, she asked. I prefer Jags, and she ambled inside. Relief and elation washed over him. Practically dancing around the back of the vehicle, he climbed into the driver's seat. It was over now. There was no escape. She was his. If she tried to get out, he could easily grab her, and if she caused a fuss, there was the fillet knife hidden under the visor. He breathed a sigh of relief and looked over to his catch with satisfaction. God, she was sexy. It had been weeks since his last catch, and he had a lot of frustration to vent. Aren't you going to call Charlotte and Ben to tell them we're coming? She asked, and he smiled and chuckled. Where's it Bill? The innocence in her eyes replaced with a deviousness. He should have stuck with just Charlotte. It's easier to remember. Do you always use the names of cities you visited? What the... He didn't finish the words as a blackness enveloped him. Thump. The sound awoke Violet from her restless sleep. 
Her back, neck, and whole body was stiff and sore from sleeping in the van's passenger seat. Thump. Rattle. She climbed out of the van to stretch in the early morning light to work out the kinks of her joints and gather her thoughts. The van was hidden out of sight down a rarely used dirt road past the overflow parking lot behind the mall. It seemed like the perfect place to stash the van until she could get control of the situation. There was no going back now, and it felt good to finally start. One would have thought it'd be easy to find a vulnerable man, someone she could use control and practice on. She knew there were plenty of overly romantic young men who dreamed of whisking away a beautiful young girl and dedicate their lives to her. But they were all too shy to make a move and too nervous to act when she approached. No matter now, she'd found her way out, and she was never going to see Fred and Rose Jones again. Rose was an idiot and bad enough. Fred Jones was the real problem. He had the most disgusting thoughts about his foster daughter. Rose may not have realized why she and Fred were having so much sex recently, but Violet understood, and Fred knew damn well. At dinner, he would watch Violet put food in her mouth and fantasize. He'd listen to Violet take showers and even pressed his ear to the door when she went to the bathroom. The humiliation was too much, and worse, she knew that the urge to act was growing day by day in Fred's mind. That didn't matter now. By the end of the day, she would be well beyond Fred's reach. Limber and as ready as she could be, she opened the passenger door and climbed back into the van. The rear section was protected from view by a heavy curtain, which she brushed aside to reveal the cavernous rear interior. There lay the creep, right where she'd left him, his hands cuffed behind his back and legs elevated and tied to the van's interior frame. He was no longer the picture of affluence and sophistication as he had presented himself the night before. Disheveled, unshaven, wrinkled, and sweat-stained, he looked more like the dirty old man that he was. As the light broke on him, he squinted before focusing on her. He didn't even try to speak through his gag. Good morning. Did you sleep well? His eyes danced away over her body, fixing first at his fillet knife that she now wore in her belt, but then scrutinizing her chest before moving back to her face. Seizing the opportunity, her mind grabbed his gaze and held. She looked deeply into his eyes, concentrated, and she saw. Not words, but images. Violet saw him remembering her buxom chest from the night before, and that she didn't fill out her t-shirt the same way. They're called padded bras, dipshit. Fucking men, all you ever think of is tits. She kicked a cardboard box at her feet. It was full of teen scream folders like the one she'd been shown the night before. Quite the operation you have here, Mr. Vagio. But wait, that isn't your real name, is it? You're actually John Johnson, isn't that right? She could see the shock and surprise in his mind, then actual coherent thoughts. She knows my name. That isn't good. She smiled sarcastically and bluffed. I know much more than you think. His mind spoke of anger. Escape. Make her pay. Make her scream. No, I won't be doing any screaming for you. She waited a moment to let it sink in and gauge the response. You're going to play by my rules, or I'm going to the police. You've been a bad boy, Mr. Johnson. She held up a pair of girls' pink underwear, which she'd found in the glove box. Its significance had intrigued her, but she needed his mind conscious to learn more. The sight of the underwear brought a sudden change in Johnson's mind. The rage was washed away and replaced by fear and something else. Well, she could sense that there was more, much more, and thinly protected. Violet pushed deeper and soon found the name. Eliza. Speaking the name directly into his mind like a spell, conjured forth images of a bright and beautiful girl with curly red hair, deep blue eyes, and a fresh and youthful face. The scene was abruptly shredded by visions beyond Violet's naive imagination as the memories in Johnson's black mind replayed. She could see Eliza in the van, on the mattress, bound in those restraints. She saw him and what he did to her. Violet heard the screams, saw his lustful and brutal pleasure, and witnessed her pain. Realization fluttered in on Violet's unsuspecting mind, struck her dumb. 
Silently and slowly she withdrew from the metal chamber of horrors and into the crisp, fresh outdoors. Violet breathed deeply as though the brisk air could cleanse her of the burden of what she had experienced. She crouched down at the base of a nearby tree and cried and wretched and cried. She cried for Eliza and cried even more when she realized that fate had been in store for herself. She would never imagined that such cruelty and evil could actually exist in the world. Well, she'd heard of such things, but to hear about it or see it in a movie was so abstract. Those were things that happened to imaginary people in faraway places. Now it was real and in a van not 20 feet away. Violet rose and began wandering the dirt road away from the mall and deeper into the forest. She needed to think. What to do? The safest thing was to walk back to the mall and turn the creep in. But where would that leave her? Back in the care of Rose and Fred Jones, and that was the best case. More likely, she'd be dumped back at Juvie for God knows how long, to be watched over by more perverts before being assigned to another Renta family paid to pretend to care about her. She planned and built herself up to this for a long time. Now she had started. Maybe this Johnson was the perfect tool. He was on the run and couldn't turn her into the police. He was dangerous to be sure, but she had ways and she'd already overpowered him. All she really needed was to keep control for a little while to use him for a day at the most. But there was something else. There was Eliza. Witnessing her pain and suffering had forged the feeling of sisterhood in Violet's heart and she couldn't walk away from that. Johnson would need to pay for what he had done. It was late afternoon when she re-entered the van. Lacking windows, the van's rear interior was hot and smelled strongly of Johnson's funk. Violet paid no mind, determined not to show weakness. Okay, Johnny, I've decided I can use you, she said in her most confident voice. He looked at her dispassionately, deeply breathing in the stale, rank air. The fear and panic were gone. Now she read an acceptance. No, it was patience. He had control of himself and was watching, waiting for an opportunity. What is this? How does she know my name? I know a lot of things, Johnny. Like I know what a sick fuck you are. She couldn't hide the disgust in her voice. No thanks. What could this bitch know about? The money, that's it. I'll tell her about the money when she gives me the chance... Where's the money? All she needed to do was ask, and his mind betrayed him. She slipped into the front of the van and reached up and under the driver's seat, right where his mind had told her. She felt and pulled out the Ziploc bag filled with cash, lots of cash. She was tempted to learn how he got it, but after her last excursion to the depths of his mind, she wasn't sure she was ready to find out. Without counting, Violet returned to the rear section to face her captive. Johnson's eyes widened at the sight of his stash and her thin hand. Fuck me, your oh Christ. How could she... She didn't know. She asked. She... She can read my mind? No, this is a game. It's some kind of trick. No tricks, Johnny. What the fuck are you? I don't know what I am, but maybe together we can find out. She reached deep into his consciousness and dug, looking. It didn't take long, and when she found it, she held it lightly. Oh God, I can feel her. Get out of me, you bitch. Let me go, let me go. She sneered at him. I don't think so. I want you to pay attention and feel this. And that thing in his mind, which she held so lightly, her mental grip turned rigid as she twisted and jerked. She felt his pain erupt around her like lightning. In truth, she didn't know what it was she tore at. Simply that it caused terrible agony in her victim, but never seemed to cause any permanent damage. Best of all, it didn't leave a mark. Johnson winced and closed his eyes, breaking her connection and allowing the pain to subside. Trembling with the aftershocks of pain, Johnson opened his eyes and Violet re-entered his mind. She needed to follow up with another demonstration to overawe him and head off any attempt at resistance. She now spoke directly into his mind. This is just a taste of what I can do. She could feel his unreasoning fear mixed with the memory of the pain. No thoughts, just fear. Good, she thought. He needs to be afraid. 
I'm going to untie your legs now. Don't even imagine escaping. Do you understand? Still, fear. Pay attention, Johnny. And she stabbed at the soft spot just enough to scare him as she screamed in his mind. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. She undid the tangle of rope suspending his legs. As they dropped, a look of relief passed over his face. Move your hands to your front, slowly. She watched as he moved his legs up and between his still cuffed hands. He dared a thought that she would release his hands as well. Fat chance. Get up, you're driving. He looked at her perplexed, his mind echoing the confusion. We've been here long enough. They'll be looking for me by now. Best to leave that out there and vague, let him fill in the details. We need to be moving, and you're my ticket out. She gave him a wide berth as he moved into the driver's seat, even exiting the passenger side, the palm of her hand resting on the handle of the fillet knife. Once he was seated, she commanded, Buckle yourself in. After she heard the click of the bell, Violet climbed behind the passenger seat, keeping her distance from her prisoner, and took a seat in the rear of the van. She tossed the keys into Johnson's lap. Now, start the van and drive. He paused. A moment of silence passed. Where am I driving to? Leave the mall by the front entrance. Turn left at the light and take the exit onto the highway headed north. At the split, bear left and continue north. He put the van in gear and headed out. I'm hungry. Shut up. You need to feed me. No, I don't. She thought better and added, I'm almost done with you. You can eat then. They'd been driving for nearly three hours, and it was already past dark. She hadn't eaten breakfast, so her hunger had been manageable for most of the day, but now she had to admit that she was also hungry. From the back of the van, she cranked her neck and saw that they were getting low on gas. The needle was getting closer to E. They needed to stop, and Violet needed to rest. She needed her strength to deal with this creep, and didn't want to risk being tired or hungry if he pulled something. She'd seen signage on the highway for motels and gas stations and directed him to take the next exit. Just off the ramp was a Motel 8 that would serve nicely. She had him pull in a park and on the far side of the building where the van wouldn't be seen easily from the office. Turn the engine off and give me the keys. He turned off the van but hesitated to hand her the keys. She tried not to let her nervousness show as she drew the six inch blade from its sheath. Move your ass into the back and lie down. She'd been tempted to enter his mind to try and dominate his body, but that was risky. It was a very difficult skill she'd never managed well enough. She was tired. He was alert to her abilities, and if she failed, it may provide the opening Johnson was waiting for. Better to use the old-fashioned way. The blade forced obedience well enough, and Johnson did as he was told. She directed him back onto the mattress and his still-cuffed hands back behind his back. She could read the patience in his mind. He was looking for an opportunity, just not seeing one. He reluctantly complied and allowed himself to be tied again. I'll be fast, so don't even think about it. She commanded and she peeled out several bills from the wad of cash. She'd counted it earlier and found it to be $2,389 exactly. She grabbed the keys from the ignition and climbed out of the van. Approaching the motel office, she realized that no talents were needed to size up the desk clerk. He was an older Indian gentleman, probably the owner, probably married to a diminutive Indian woman, perhaps intrigued by the cute young thing walking into his business, but not fool enough to think anything past a business opportunity. Violet didn't bother to expose her flesh, and instead exposed the bills. She soon walked out of the office with a few questions and the key to room 119. She had made sure that Patel, which was the name displayed on his desk, found something to busy himself with in the back for the next few minutes, so she wasn't worried about being observed. Johnson was still not in the mood to test the point of the fillet knife and submitted to being herded into the hotel room. Sit, Violet commanded, pointing at a chair she'd positioned against the bed frame. 
He gave her an askance look, but did as he was told. Once sitting, she tied his limbs and midsection tightly to the legs, arms, and back of the chair. She used much more rope than needed and tied the knots in large, clumsy tangles. Johnson had plenty of rope in his van, and she used the rest to secure the chair itself to the bed frame. Feeling more secure, Violet moved to the desk by the bed and started opening the drawers. The top contained a maroon Gideon Bible, but the second had a few flyers for local pizza places. She selected one and, using the phone on the desk, placed an order for a large with extra cheese and anchovies. I don't like anchovies, he called. Yeah, well, what you like is fucked up, asshole, she threw back at him. They shared silence as Violet's rapidly flicking through the channels on the TV until the pizza arrived. The transaction was conducted outside the room and the pizza was eaten in silence by Violet alone. Johnson watched in resentment but knew better than to open his mouth. After finishing her meal, Violet took several gulps of soda from the styrofoam cup so generously provided by management and braced herself for what she knew must now come. She dragged a chair over and sat facing Johnson from several feet away. He looked sweaty, smelly, famished, and beaten. Violet pierced into his eyes and entered his mind. Okay, you raping asshole. Tell me about Eliza. Twenty minutes later, Violet was outside, sitting on the concrete floor, her back against the door to room 119 with tears pouring down her face. Johnson had treated her to the grand tour of his depraved mind. She'd seen it all. His body may be weary, but his mind was strong. He had gleefully shown her more than she or anyone would ever want to see, things that would haunt her for the rest of her days. Many times she had needed to use the pain to make him relent on the details and focus on the necessary information. It was so much worse than she had suspected. There hadn't just been Eliza. Flashes of many young girls had come and gone. She didn't need to survey the details to know their fates. Violet tried to hold back the flood of obscenity as best she could. If she saw too much, she'd feel the same responsibility to all them that she felt for Eliza. Violet knew she wasn't yet strong enough to fight for all of them. No, she would do justice to this one. And that one would need to stand for all. The exertion had been worth it. She learned what she wanted to know. As she gradually built the strength to walk past the thing tied up in the room, she sat and she shook, unaware of Patel in the dimly lit office. He'd watched scenes like this unfold so many times in his parking lot. He tried to be sympathetic, but there was nothing he could do except guard his own interests. Customers like these, while common, sometimes meant trouble. Patel thought it best to keep a careful watch. The tingling in his arms slowly subsided, but the soreness remained. Good thing that dizzy bitch didn't know how to tie a proper knot. Witch, demon, or whatever the fuck she was, she knew, and that made her dangerous. But she had a weakness. The eyes. If he could get out of this chair and avoid her eyes, he could get control of the situation. Then he would make that bitch silent for good. Johnson dwelt on these things as he rocked the chair back and forth, back and forth, the knots slowly loosening. His hobby had taught him the benefits of tying a good knot, and he'd watched the bitch tie enough clumsy tangles to see its chance. With a good heave, he threw his weight and felt the chair as it went up to the tipping point. With one last hard heave, the chair tipped over, twisted the now slack ropes and shattered on the floor. He knew Ruckus had certainly woken the witch, who had locked herself in the bathroom, but he had had start. His hands were still in cuffs, but he easily removed the loops of rope from his body and stumbled to his unsteady feet. On shaky legs, he went for the door and tumbled outside and into the lights of the parking lot. The movement of the security camera caught Patel's eyes as Johnson lifted himself and stumbled, fell again, rose and shambled the last few feet to the van. Patel thought the man had fallen again, but now he could clearly see the man reaching up under the van's rear wheel and frame. Patel saw only briefly as the man pulled out a hidden gun and headed back toward the open door of room 119. Movement was relieving the soreness in Johnson's legs as he rose from under the van, the comforting weight of the 357 at his grip. 
He had no plan past killing the witch and making a fast getaway. She knew too much to live, and it was too dangerous to try and capture. He re-entered the dark room, his eyes dilated from the streetlight outside. Despite the gloom, he could see the bathroom door wide open. Movement. Without looking, he blasted in the general direction, the sound reverberating in the small room. Again, something moved, and he blasted away, each shot flying wild. He was running out of time. Taking a grip of the pistol with both hands, he risked looking over the sights to aim, but it was too late. He had her in his sights, and he was in hers. Like a bull, he felt the impact of her entering his mind. Drop the gun! He heard in a strange, accented male voice from behind. The command was followed by the distinctive cocking of a shotgun. Drop the gun, she commanded his mind. I said drop the gun! The man ordered again. Drop the gun! He tried to pull the trigger, but he could feel her burning in his brain, trying to gain control. His hand shook, muscles and synapses torn by conflicting orders. He felt her groping the hurting place. Drop the gun! Drop the gun. I said drop it. Every bit of his mind was focused on the struggle with the mental invader. Unable to reason or think ahead, he held desperately to what little control he had. Not to lower the gun, to keep her in his sights, to find a way to escape. The room lit with the alternating blue and red lights of a police cruiser. Sweat poured down Johnson's face. The hunter had been cornered. Even if he could somehow pull the trigger and kill this monster, he would never get away. They'd find the van, find his implements, the pictures on his computer. His hand shook and the sweat poured. Escape. Suddenly, Johnson's mental commands changed, causing Violet to briefly lose her grip. In that split second of freedom, Johnson acted. He placed the gun barrel to his own temple and then pulled the trigger. The deafening report was followed by a profound silence as Johnson's head poured its contents onto the unused polyester bedspread. Officer Roscoe heard the shot as he exited his cruiser and approached the motel room with his gun drawn. Patel, shotgun in hand, gave the officer a wide berth to enter. They'd been through this routine before, and both knew what was expected of the other. With the arrival of Roscoe and the suicide of the man, Patel assumed the situation was under control. I need to check on my guests. He called to Roscoe in his heavily accented English. But first, Patel went back to the office to return the shotgun. He knew better than to be an armed foreign man banging on motel doors at night. Roscoe quickly assessed the situation in the room. The man was clearly dead. No coroner was needed to make that call. A shadow attracted his eyes. Hands up, he cried as he trained his weapon on the dark specter. Roscoe's eyes adjusted to the gloom, and he found himself aiming at a lithe young girl staring intently at him. Somehow Roscoe found himself lowering the gun. He knew this was against regulations, but at the moment he seemed to neither care nor even be aware he was doing it. The only thing he could do, the only thing he wanted to do, was drown in this young girl's beautiful green eyes. A sense of calm came over Roscoe as she moved closer, their gazes locked. His view of the gloomy motel room clouded, dissolved, and gave way to a daydream-like vision of a parking lot surrounded by trees. It seemed so surreal, yet as vivid as a memory. He could even make out the sign reading, Freetown State Forest. Beside the sign, he spied a large white van, the very same he'd noticed in the parking lot outside the motel room. As though he was looking through the eyes of another, the scene moved forward past the van, along a path into the woods, then to the right, off the path, through the brambles, and past a large boulder. The view continued to move deeper, into the overgrowth to a fallen tree, and behind that tree, a long, shallow hole, partway filled by a black trash bag. Lingering on the plastic bulk, a soft female voice whispered in his mind, Find her. The vision, daydream, continued as he saw the bag covered under dirt and then leaves. The viewer looked up, and Roscoe could see the white van in the parking lot through the woods, perhaps a hundred feet away. Again, the voice said, Find her. Forget me. Find her. The officer continued to stare dumbly as Violet slipped past him, peeked around the doorway, disappeared into the night, and was gone.
The money was running out, but Violet needed to splurge. The loneliness of being on the run was getting to be too much. It was time for some fun. Time for her to feel like a kid again. She rubbed some warmth back into her arms as the line slowly snaked its way along the cracked sidewalk before disappearing into the club's entrance. Tonight was an 18-plus show. It wasn't too much of a stretch, but her diminutive frame would beg for an ID check. She could handle that. For now, she kept a low profile and avoided conversation until she reached the front of the line and the welcome warmth of the club's entrance. The bouncer, a bald beefcake with a black goatee, looked at her with a knowing smirk. Ticket and ID, please, he asked, skepticism written across his face. Violet handed over the ticket, but she had no ID to give. The bouncer took the ticket with a knowing smirk and began to speak. But before he could utter a sound, Violent returned his gaze and entered. It took no more than a moment to manipulate his unsuspecting mind. A minor rearranging of thoughts was all it took. It was harmless, really. A glazed look came over the bouncer's face as he tore her ticket, senselessly handed it back, and waved her through, making no move or protest as she disappeared into the dark noise beyond. He'd already forgotten her. Inside, Violet's youth was no less conspicuous, but she wouldn't be challenged so long as she didn't try to buy a drink or cause a scene. She took her time exploring the club and taking measure of the crowd. Events like this were great for people watching. It seemed more like a costume ball or a Halloween night than a metal concert. Everywhere she looked, young people preened about in their best leather and denim costumes festooned with patches and emblems like a jumbled collection of merit badges. She felt good being among people like herself. Well, more like herself, at least. Her abilities had advantages, but life in the shadows had created a sense of alienation. Having no friends and being alone at an event like this, where everyone else was in groups or pairs, only deepened those feelings. Violet floated over to the merchandise booth to peruse the concert shirts, more to seem occupied than anything else. The wad of cash she'd scored from Johnson had grown dangerously small, and that forty dollars could feed her for some time. Hey! came a voice over the den of the crowd and DJ. Violet turned and found herself faced with another young girl. By her size and body, Violet guessed she was the same age or close to, but her heavily lidded eyes suggested that she was a bit older. The girl was dressed for a night out, in pink fishnets that disappeared into the short black skirt and exposed midriff leading to a low-cut tube top that barely covered a modest chest and topped off by a puff of artificially wavy blonde hair and gaudy makeup. She screamed glam punk. You look young for eighteen, the girl challenged with a catty look. So do you, Violet tearsly responded. I wonder why. The girl added with a wink and a lilt that would pervade her speech. Without missing a beat, she went on. I freaking love this club. It's like the best place to see a show in. Such a good scene. Violet wasn't sure how to respond, but wanted to keep talking to the girl. She offered a non-committal, Yeah, it looks like it. The girl smiled broadly at Violet. I'm Abigail, she said, deftly extending her right hand. Violet hesitated briefly before taking it. It had been so long since she'd spoken to another person her age that it seemed strange. Strange, but also comfortable. Normal, like the way her life should be. I'm Violet, she responded. Nice to meet you, said Abigail. But really, call me Abby, everyone does. Hey, it's getting late. Let's move towards the stage. I want to be close when the band starts. She grabbed Violet by the arm and led her through the throng. The pair snaked through the crowd, moving even closer to the stage as Abby shamelessly pressed her body against guys only to slide past them. Violet declined to imitate and simply rode Abby's wake. They talked mostly about music and the bands that they liked, or rather, Abby spoke and Violet occasionally interjected. She seemed to be the perfect popular girl, bubbly, charismatic, comfortable, grabbing and holding the attention of others. Violet took advantage of a slight break in Abby's monologue to blurt out somewhat awkwardly, How come you're alone here? Abby gave another catty look. She seemed to give them often. A man may have found it seductive, but it had no effect on Violet. Because most of my friends aren't into metal and can't be bothered trying to slip into an 18-plus night, Abby answered. 
How'd you get in? Probably the same way you did. This gave Violet a start, and her eyes betrayed her. Abby noticed and gave a knowing smile and wink, as to say it was no big deal. Violet's thoughts raced. What did Abby mean? She couldn't know what she had implied, but Violet could find out. Abby's wide, deer-like eyes were so open and expressive that she could be in and out of the girl's mind easily. But that seemed wrong. Like a betrayal. Everything was going so well, and she was having fun just being young, so why mess it up over something so small? Best to just let it go. Abby opened her mouth to continue, but instead abruptly pulled a vibrating cell phone from her pocket. The screen's glow lit Abby's face and reflected in her eyes as her fingers danced across the glass surface. Texting, Violet correctly assumed. Finished, Abby opened her mouth to start in again, but this time it was interrupted as the lights dimmed to the darkness, signaling that the show was about to start. The crowd roared as an illumination from the band's ominous logo appeared on stage and the show began. The second encore finished, leaving both girls exhausted and disheveled. Violet couldn't remember the last time she'd had so much fun. That was freaking awesome, shrieked Abby. Violet nodded in agreement. I can't believe they played Love Bites at the end. That's like my favorite freaking song. Abby looked peaked and a bit pale, but it could be the lights. Come on, she said as she grabbed Violet's arm and led her toward the bar. I'm so thirsty after that. I can't believe they played Love Bites. The club had mostly cleared out, and the few available seats were occupied by drunken young fans waiting for their nausea to subside before stumbling away. The two girls stood by the bar, each drinking a soft drink, and continued to engage in small talk about their now-shared experience. Abby suddenly rolled her eyes, placed her cup down on the bar, and reached in her pocket to pull out her cell phone. Just one sec, she said as her fingers deftly poked about the screen. She finished quickly and tucked the cell phone back into her pocket. Texting your parents? asked Violet. Abby snorted. <laughs> Just a friend. A boyfriend? Violet was trying to be catty now, but it didn't feel right, and she knew it didn't sound right. The awkward moment passed as Abby shook her head and took a sip of her drink before continuing. So, you want to try and meet the band? Meet the band? Violet scoffed. What are you talking about? Well, don't get your hopes up. Not everyone does it, but if the band is really cool, sometimes they'll hang out by their tour bus and meet a few fans. I've done it before. We're young, pretty girls. They'll take a few moments for us. Abby added with a wink. Violet considered. It didn't seem too far-fetched, and it wasn't as though she had any place to go. Nobody was waiting up for her. Besides, she liked talking to her new friend. Just being with another person felt good. Why not let the night linger before going back to her real life? The girls left the club for the crisp spring air of the city. Abby in the lead. Down here. I think I saw the tour bus parked off Washington Street when I came in. Come on. Violet followed Abby around the corner and down to the darkened street. A pair of blue-tinged headlights cast the girls' shadows along the pavement, but illuminated no tour bus. By the time Violet realized a large black SUV Suburban had stopped alongside them, it was too late. Abby, baby, called a cheerful voice from the rolled-down passenger window. Abby turned and replied, Hey, Steve, I was just looking for you. Of course you were, baby, of course you were. Two giant barrel-shaped men ambled out of the car and approached the girls. A quick glance across their eyes told Violet all she needed to know. They were ready for violence. The one in the car called Steve continued in a friendly cadence. So, Abby, baby, he said it like it was one word. Is this the one you were telling me about? Abby nodded. Violet, this is my friend Steve. He takes care of me. A cold, sinking feeling flooded Violet's body as a realization set in. She trusted Abby, even thought of her as a friend. Ain't you gonna say hi? asked Steve. The light glinted on a gold tooth, and Violet could see her own image reflected back in her in his dark, mirrored sunglasses. Her mind raced. Play it cool, she thought. Hi, she responded, trying to seem collected and unfazed. In her peripheral vision, she glimpsed the behemoths moving behind her, 
cutting off an escape. Well, what are we waiting for? We'll sit the road, Steve commanded the girls. Abby obeyed without comment or hesitation, but Violet hung back. Steve turned the mirror lenses on Violet. Well, do you just hop on in, Violet? I'd hate for us to get set off on the wrong foot. A massive hand fell on Violet's shoulder and began driving her forward. Escape was not an option. It never had been, not since she decided to trust Abby. With effortless power, the behemoth guided Violet to the rear passenger and toward the vehicle. There was no choice. She climbed into the SUV. The interior of the vehicle had been modified to create a spacious passenger area. The second row had been removed and the first reversed to face the rear. Steve sat alone, sprawled out on the rear bench, facing the two girls across from him. So, Steve, started Abby, that thing we talked about, you know if I brought you somebody? Don't worry, baby. I'll take care of you when we get back to the casa. Violet was scared, but understood that in situations like this, looking weak was dangerous. It was best to seem confident, maybe even dumb. The casa? she asked. Steve turned his lenses toward Violet. The casa, he answered. It's my place of business, and your new place of employment. Which leads to the next issue, sweetie. It ain't normal for somebody looking like you to slip into a club alone like you did. You got anybody out there who might be looking out for you? Someone that might object to me giving you this opportunity? She saw a dim chance. Actually, yeah. Uh-huh. And... What, may I ask, is his name? Johnny. Johnny, Steve smiled broadly. I never heard of any Johnny, and I know every player worth knowing. So either your Johnny is a two-bit nobody I don't need to worry about, or he doesn't exist. You're not lying to me, are you? Violet kept silent. Because lies are nothing to build a relationship on. Real or not, this Johnny ain't going to be a problem, is he? Too terrified to lie or even speak, she simply shook her head. Good. Because I don't like having problems. Problems are bad for business, but old Payday and Breaker here, they're real good at solving problems. Ain't that right, boy? Damn right, boss. The hulking driver responded over his shoulder. All kinds of problems, Steve added cryptically, looking directly at Violet. Steve, Abby butted in. Do you think that I could have just a little taste now? It's been so long. Bitch, I told you. When we get back to the console, I'll hook you up. Till then, shut your mouth. Shit, you ought to learn something from this Violet here. She knows how to keep silent. Let the man do the talking. Ain't that right? Silence. Steve smiled. See? That's what I'm talking about. You learn quick. I can see you're going to work out just fine. Steve prattled on all the way to the casa, which turned out to be a white two-story building that might once have been called Victorian, but the only architectural description it now merited was dilapidated. The SUV parked, and Violet, flinked closely by Payday and Breaker, followed Steve and Abby up to the cracked and wobbly paved walkway. Steve pounded on the window a slab of a door, white paint flaking off onto the stoop. Open up, it's me, called Steve. A mechanical locking mechanism sounded and the door creaked open, spilling forth a gloomy smoke-filled light that smelled strongly of cigarettes, pot, and musk. A sub crew? Called Steve as he sauntered in. Violet again felt a powerful hand on her shoulder that drove her inside. The interior perfectly complemented the circumstances. Every flat surface was piled with various magazines, overflowing ashtrays, crumpled baggies, drug paraphernalia, empty bottles, bald wads of aluminum foil, and discarded food wrappers. Among the detritus on torn and broken furniture sat several inebriated young men, the crew, as Steve had called them. Violet's green eyes fell across their bleary eyes and briefly entered a few minds, but there was nothing to see behind their stares. Abby called out in her habitual bubbly voice. Hi, guys. One smirking thug on a shredded couch responded in a gravelly voice. Abby, my favorite little hoe. We going on a date later tonight, right? Ask Steve about that. Steve ignored the interchange and raised his hand for attention. Listen up, boys. 
I want to introduce y'all to a new employee. This here is Violet. Young as always, eh, Steve? Commented one. You got a good eye for talent, man. This one's fine, said another. Steve waved his hand dismissively. Yeah, well, hands off for now. She's booked already. Violet raised her eyebrows at this. Introduction's done. I'm gonna go show a little lady to her room so she can rest up for tomorrow's first day of work. Come on, sugar. And he waved Violet to follow. But Steve, Abby desperately interjected. What about my fix? Oh, Christ, I said I'd take care of you. Hassle me again, you're gonna be dope sick all night. Now entertain these gentlemen till I get back, and then I'll hook you up. Steve led the way through the smoky gloom into a short hall lit by incandescent bulbs that hung from bare wires. Violet was driven from behind one of the behemoths, breaker or payday, she had no idea which. Steve stopped at a bare door that, instead of a knob, had only a metal plate in the center of which was a keyhole. Steve produced a single key from his pocket and unlocked the door, which creaked on its hinges as it swung open and ushered Violet in with a gracious wave of the arm, like a butler showing off a five-star luxury suite. This here's your new home, and office rolled into one. You live and work here for now, till you prove yourself. Behave, do what you're told, and keep the customers happy. Make yourself worth my while, and I'll make it worth your while, we clear? Violet silently looked at her own image, reflected in his dark glasses. Good. You get some rest, you got a big day tomorrow. The door swung closed, leaving Violet alone in the dark. Bill pulled his B&W into the open garage beside the Casa de Amor. Every time he thought of that ironic name, it made him smile. He heaved his corpulent bulk out of the driver's seat and clumsily pulled down the garage door before moving through the gloom and the cobwebs to a side exit that conveniently opened into the fenced-in backyard. He trod heavily on the worn path through the overgrowth and climbed the stairs of the porch. The sodden, rotting boards creaked under his weight as he rapped on the door three times. A gruff, who's there, called from inside. He saw me pull up, open up, Bill called. The latch opened and the door swung in. The doorman fell back into the shadows to reveal an approaching Steve striding to meet Bill, his hand outstretched. My man, exclaimed Steve as he chummily shook Bill's meaty hand. It's been too long. Uh, work, you know. I heard you got something for me, eh? Uh, you know it, fresh meat from the street. Me from the street. <laughs> you make it sound so appealing. Ah, uh, take my word, man. This one's nice and fresh and fine as hell. Another runaway, huh? Steve nodded and led the way into the hall. Recent, by the looks of it. Following behind, Bill continued. But I'm the first, right? First of mine. Good enough. The way you run them, they aren't good for much after a few months. Steve stopped at the door. All right. She's in here. One hour? To start, Bill pulled out a wad of bills. Regular deal? Sure thing. Steve replied, pocketing the cash as he unlocked the door and pushed it open. Here's the key if you need it, he said, passing it to Bill, and then continued loudly. If this bitch gives you a hard time, you just call out. I'm close by. Bill cast his eyes over the dank and miserable room. It was square and prison cell sized. Paint and plaster flaked on the cracked walls. The ceiling was water-stained, but the floor looked to be hard wood, but was almost black from years of neglect. The only furniture was a bureau, a lamp with a humming bulb, and a metal-framed, unmade bed on which sat the girl. Steve hadn't been exaggerating. If Bill had to guess, he'd say she was about sixteen, tiny, a mere waif with long, dark hair that hid her downcast face. Bill smiled at Steve over his shoulder. I'm sure we'll be fine. Have fun, Steve called as he patted Bill's shoulder and quietly closed the door. The lock turned from without. So, Bill said with a smile, we are violent. No answer. Well, I don't need to call you anything, but you're going to call me Mr., he said, unhitching his belt. Now look at me and say my name. Violet looked up and met his gaze. At first, he was struck by her beauty, 
how her angular features were framed by long dark tresses, but then by those deeply beautiful green eyes, he caught his breath and found he couldn't look away. Not that he wanted to. All that existed in that moment was an overwhelming loveliness that seemed to engulf his mind. His fading reason dimly realized the trap, but it was too late. He couldn't escape, even if he wanted to. Bill fell his knees before Violet and gazed up at her as she took full possession. Time passed in a blur. He relived past conquests and enjoyed flashes of gratifications he had never experienced. He saw scenes of lovely young girls bound in a white van and witnessed cruelties that his jaded imagination had yet conceived. But there was something else. A scratching in the depths of his brain, as though some alien being were lurking in the folds of his subconscious, moving and rearranging ideas and thoughts. At times, he sensed its presence and moved to reveal its shadowy form, but then his attention would be distracted by the opening of some new vista of beautiful obscenity. Now and again came a knocking on wood and a voice as though from another world, asking something he couldn't make out. Nonetheless, he would hear his own voice respond simply with cries of more, more. Time passed and the intensity slacked and waned. The visions became repetitive and less engaging. The lurker's presence faded and his grip on his own mind reasserted. He awoke suddenly to find himself sitting on the floor, his pants around his ankles, and his hand on himself sticky with cool, drying seed. He looked up to see the girl. What was the name? Violet. Lying on the tattered bed, her face to the wall, shaking with sobs. Bill smiled at that. He always felt it gratifying to leave a whore in tears. He wiped his hands on his undershirt and pulling up his pants, noticed that the watch read 7.08 p.m. He'd been there for more than four hours. Where had the time gone? He hurried to his feet, fumbled the key from his pants pocket, unlocked the door and swung it open to reveal a waiting Steve. About damn time, buddy. Steve said dryly, his stare so severe that it pierced out from behind his dark shades. Yeah, well, I don't want to have a problem here, Billy, by man, but the thing is, you ran well over your time. I had another appointment that you shot right to hell for me. Fortunately, they let Abby fill in, but this shit ain't cool. <sighs> Sorry, man, Bill explained, trying to explain it off as though he could control the situation. I just lost track of time. Yeah, well, I didn't. And you know what they say about time and money, so... Oh, come on. You know I'm good for it. I just need to run to the bank and get some... You need to run? I think you mean we need to run in my car with payday driving. Am I right? That's fine. Bill smiled and put his hand on Steve's shoulder, trying to diffuse the tension. Steve's expression didn't reciprocate. You hooked me up today. I'm not going to do anything to screw that up. I'm glad we're straight. It's just that... What? That... Bill stopped himself and struggled against his words, but to no avail. Some compulsion came over him as though he lost control of his own mouth as the words mechanically came forth. I don't want anyone else to see Violet. I want her for myself. Steve's face shone with disbelief. And... Bill went on, surprised at his own words, but unable to stop himself. I want to buy her from you. Steve threw back his head and laughed. <laughs> Shit, man, is that pussy made of gold or what? I had you pegged wrong. I never thought you were the type to fall in love with some hoe. It's not like that. There's something about her, something I can't explain. I. Bill fought against his words, but he was unable to avoid blurting out, I need to buy her. Steve's face lit with amusement. Damn, that bitch must be mad crazy to stir up your nasty head. Problem is, you know I don't roll like that. That hoe in there, she belongs to me. And if she's half as crazy as you say, that pussy's worth a lot more to me than it is to you. Steve put his arm around Bill's slumped shoulders as he led the man down the hall and toward the car. Besides, buyer? The fuck you gonna do with her? Keep her in a box or something? He said with a laugh. You're right, man. I don't know what I was thinking. Twenty minutes later, the latch to Violet's door opened and Steve emerged. Baby, you've done some fine work today. Violet didn't look at him. You're a natural-born hoe. He tossed the McDonald's bag on the floor that landed with a crunch. Dinner's served. You eat up, and when you're done, put these on. 
He tossed in a grocery bag filled with what Violet assumed were clothes. Now listen, eat, then dress. I don't want any stain on those clothes. Tonight you're hitting the streets with Abby, baby, and I need you looking good. Hitting the streets with Abby, Violet thought. So it hadn't worked. At least she'd escaped the afternoon and bought a little more time. One thing Violet was sure of, this was not going to happen. She'd rather die than be a victim. What's the matter, Abby baby? Why you keep grabbing your head? I have the worst fucking headache. Abby cups her temple as the pain hit again. I was fine earlier, it just started. Shit timing. Steve, I don't want to turn tricks with a headache. Maybe I can get a little taste now before I start, just for the pain. Steve snorted. <laughs> I don't think so, Abby baby. I need you working, not passed out in some dumpster. Besides, tonight's Violet's first night on the turf, and I need you to show her the ropes. Of course, from what I hear, she could teach you a thing or two. <laughs> Ain't that right, Violet? No answer. Steve chuckled and nodded approvingly. Cool, baby, cool. Abby looked at Violet on the seat across from her and felt the pressure building for another bolt of pain. This chick looks pissed, Abby thought to herself. Yeah, well, tough fucking luck. Maybe it was rotten what she'd done, but she needed another warm snatch around. Ever since Mandy left, she was pulling all the jobs herself, and it was wearing her down. Besides, if this chick was going to live on the streets, she would end up a whore sooner or later, and good enough for her. At this, Abby's thoughts were drowned out by another wave of pain broke over her. Steve looked askance at Abby. All right, Breaker, you can stop here. This will be fine. Violet and Abby climbed out of the black suburban and onto the dim sidewalk. Steve rolled down the window and looked at Violet through his lenses. John gives you shit and don't want to pay, mention my name. You see the police, run. They catch you, don't mention my name. Don't talk to them. Don't say nothing until I come for you. You feel me? Silence. Steve nodded and gave the eyes on you sign as the SUV sped off. Let's go, said Abby. The game's nice to do BJ's. Anything else takes too long. Steve needs us to make... But she was interrupted when Violet grabbed her arm and looked into Abby's face. Why? Violet asked, staring deeply at her. Tell me why you keep doing this. Don't you want to be better? The questions boiled up so much pain that it took all her effort to prevent it from spilling onto her face. Not that it mattered. Violet could already see it in Abby's soul and knew she spoke her heart. You think you're some fucking princess? This is real, bitch. This is what I do to live, and you want to know what? You ain't no better, and you're going to live the same fucking thing. It made Abby feel good to unload, to make somebody else feel like she did, worse even. Violet had just arrived at the bottom, while Abby had already been there long enough to get used to it. Violet's eyes blazed as Abby continued. You may not get it, but I know what I am, and I know what you are. You're just a trash street slut. Explosive, blinding agony dropped Abby to her knees and left her dry heaving onto the pavement. Through tears and sweat, Abby watched as Violet lifted first one foot and then the other, smashing each down on the ground hard, breaking off the high heels. She don't know what I am. Violet spat at her as she turned and ran. Abby smiled. She knew this wasn't the smart thing to do. The prissy bitch would never get far. Steve was far too careful with his possessions. Sure enough, just as Violet reached the end of the street, the black SUV pulled to a screeching halt as a towering shadow poured from the passenger side. The thug easily caught Violet and held her back against his huge body as Steam calmly stepped forward to confront his disobedient employee. And what the fuck was that? No sooner you get out here than you try to run? Violet, I thought we understood each other. No, I... I wasn't trying to run, Violet cried. I... I saw a rat. I hate rats. No, Steve. Abby, stumbling over, a shit-eating grin on her face. There wasn't any rat. She said she was going to run away and try to get me to go with her. She said that we'd be better off without you with some lesbo fantasy of hers. Lesbo fantasy, eh? Said Steve. The giant's hands dug deeply into Violet's flesh, powerful and irresistible. Payday, toss this bitch in the car. We're going back to the casa. Abby, you just earned yourself a night off and a reward, he added with a smile. 
Abby beamed and winked at Violet as Payday effortlessly manhandled her helpless body into the back of the SUV. From somewhere, a roll of duct tape was produced that was used to blind Violet's eyes, gag her mouth, and bind her hands behind her back. She heard the Suburban's back hatch pop open and felt herself roughly tossed inside. The bouncing of the vehicle settled as the car came to a stop and the engine died. As the hatch lifted, a dim phosphorescent light shone around the edges of the duct tape over Violet's eyes. Strong hands grabbed her and roughly hauled her out of the trunk before setting her on our feet, gripping her shoulders and shoving her forward. Violet dragged her feet, unwilling to assist in her nightmare. Better fucking walk or I'll drag you by the air, growled the deep voice from her captor from behind. With no choice, Violet allowed herself to be driven along the cracked pavement and into the brothel, roughly shoved past the smiling Steve who held her door open as she was sightlessly tossed in, falling helplessly under her face, her hands still bound behind her and unable to break her fall. Break her, Steve's voice called. You're up, brother man. He turned his attention back to Violet. As for you, bitch, you're going to learn a hard lesson tonight. Steve slapped Breaker on the back and said, Have at her, man. Show her how you earned your name. Steve withdrew as the giant slammed the door heavily, shut and locked the door before turning to regard Violet menacingly as she lay helpless on the floor. Time to get down to business. Gonna work your ass over good he said in a deep, gravelly voice as he drew a box cutter. Terror rushed through Violet as she thrashed and gasped, ragged breaths over the duct tape gag, wet with drool and spit. She felt herself grabbed from behind and effortlessly lifted as Breaker had manipulated her tiny body, pressing her face down into the unmade bed. Cold metal scraped across her wrists and the duct tape binding her separated, releasing her hands. Scraping at the back of her head as the wet and dripping gag went slack and dropped from her mouth. Finally, the bind was quickly ripped away from her eyes, taking strands of hair with it. Roughly turned over, Violet gasped for breath and peeled her eyes open to reveal the disgusting male lust that she had seen all too often before smiling down at her. The drool soaked gag still clung to her hair, and her makeup was smeared all over her face. Nice and messy, just the way I like them. Breaker crooned. Now is her chance, now or never. Violet focused and charged into Breaker's mind, sharply and quickly. His eyes rolled back and the limp mass of muscle and fat slumped heavily on top of her. Violet had no idea how long Breaker would be out, minutes or hours. The real question was how long until Steve and his cronies decided to check on her. She wriggled from underneath the unconscious monster, his body flopped heavily to the floor. Her clothes were still in the bed where she left him. She quickly stripped out the whore outfit Steve had provided, wiped her face clean, the skimpy lace threads, and dressed in her own jeans and t-shirt. They may be dirty and crumpled, but more appropriate. Moving to Beaker, she rifled through his pockets, quickly finding the keys and a wad of cash, both of which she stashed into her own pockets. Finally, she pried the box cutter from his fingers and considered her options. The blade was something, but far too little to use against Steve and his crew. She had her talents, but even still, the struggle would be heavily against her, and she couldn't pierce Steve's glasses. She needed a distraction, something to give her time. As Violet surveyed her room, her eyes fell on the lamp, and a bad idea germinated in her mind. She dragged the dresser and placed it on top of the bed, unplugged the lamp, cut through the brittle nylon shielding of the power cord, and twisted the bare positive and negative sections of the wire together. She then wrapped the bedcloths around the exposed copper and laid the sheet-wrapped wire on top of the mattress. Unsure of what to expect, Violet gingerly held the plug of the lamp's power wire, and leaning away, ready to jump clear, she decisively drove the plug into the wall socket. Heavy black wisps of smoke immediately began emanating from both the sheets and the wall outlet, quickly followed by aggressive sparks that erupted from it as if from a sparkler. The smoke and sparkling gave way to a flashing and loud pop as the fuses blew, taking out the power and plunging her room and most of the first floor into sudden darkness. The gloom surrounding Violet brightened as flames rose from the bedclothes and quickly began to consume the bed as they moved up the wall and filled the room with a noxious smoke. Violet dropped flat to the floor and crawled toward the door. The short blade in one hand and the key in the other, the room was filling quickly, and Violet, staying low, felt with her hands up on the door of the keyhole. 
The unlocked door swung open, and with it a burst of air filled Violet's starved lungs, but she also breathed stronger life into the blaze, which roared with growing power, gushing forth more smoke. Violet rose from her knees to a low hunch to move quickly, but suddenly strong hands grabbed her shoulders and she shook as Steve's voice boomed at her. What the living fuck did you do, bitch? His fist connected with her cheek, knocking her small frame to the ground. The box cutter skittered out of her hands. You think you're going to burn my shit down, huh? He said as he climbed on top of her and raised his fist to pummel her under the ground. A deafening wail erupted from somewhere and distracted Steve, who looked up as Breaker tumbled out of Island's room, howling and holding his hands to his face, senselessly barreling forward, tipping over Violet Steve before rising only to madly flail down the hall. Recovering herself, Violet reached for the box cutter, but found herself gripping a pair of mirrored glasses. She rolled away and rose to a low crouch. Steadying her gaze, she watched as Steve began to find his footing and raised his face to meet hers. His eyes were pale and washed out green, almost colorless. As if their stares met, Violet saw that he could see. Shocked but unfazed, she pushed forward, finding only a weak resistance. A mere second more and she would have broken through, but he broke the gaze and looked at her askance. So that's how you got away from Breaker and Billy Boy, too, huh? Things starting to make sense now, said Steve as he backed down the hall toward the front door, rapidly disappearing into the smoke and gloom. Shocked and choking, Violet dropped to the ground. Out of the darkness and over the growling roar of the blaze, she heard Steve's voice call. All right, come on out. We'll make it quick. Or you can burn like the witch you are. Hell of a way to go. If it were me, I'd want it quick. His words were punctuated by short bursts of gunfire, the bullets flying harmlessly overhead. She'd rather burn than give him the satisfaction, but Violet wasn't ready to give up now or ever. Escape and survival, that was all. Violet crawled along the floor as fast as she could on hands and knees, the smoke so dense that it had sunk to the floor and was searing her lungs and eyes, forcing them closed. Alone and in danger, her mind reached forward. Dimly and sightlessly, she sensed a short way ahead of herself as she moved forward. She sensed doors on either side and reached up to try the handles, each locked, no escape. She crawled further and felt a flight of stairs going up. Common sense told her it wouldn't be any safer, but there was nowhere else to go. She crawled up the stairs, choking and sweating as the temperature skyrocketed. At the top of her mind, told a small open area. Closed doors on three sides. Without thinking, Violet chose one of them to the left and stumbled into the room. Fresh air. She slammed the door shut to preserve what little air there was, but it was hot and a wisp of smoke was already seeping up through the floor vent. Not much time. Her eyes dashed around the room, looking for something. A window. She tried the latch, but her hands lacked the strength to budge the frozen mechanism. Sweat pouring down her face, matting her hair, she looked about the room. A massive old-style CRT TV, a rug, a couch with small throw pillows, and another bad idea. As the heat intensified, the room began to fog with sooty smoke. Violet grabbed a blanket from the couch and haphazardly wrapped it around her body before grabbing a throw pillow and holding it in front of her face. Lowering her shoulder, she charged at the glass window. The cushion softened the blow as the glass cracked and shattered, but held and sent Violet sprawling backwards, the taste of aspirin filling her mouth. The room darkening, she rose for another try. Violet charged again, putting her full force into the impact. This time, the window blew outward and the momentum carried her body over the sill and into the cold, fresh night. The pillow blocked her face and blanket protected some parts of her body, but her arms and legs were slashed by jagged shards of glass and the twisted, rusted metal that adorned the edges of the window. The cloth blanket caught on the edge of the window snapped back and dropped Violet, tumbling down the roof and off the ledge, falling the rest of the way to the ground. An ill-kept hedge kept her body from the worst of the impact, but the branches scraped and gouged her. No time for pain. She'd made a chance and needed to use it. Violet forced her aching and bleeding body up and staggered as fast as she could into the street in protective darkness. What was that? asked Payday, Steve looking at him inquisitively. Thought I heard something, like glass breaking. Breaker sat down on the curb, his hands covering his face as Abby and the rest of the crew stood in awe as they watched the flames consume the Casa de Amor. I'll check it out, responded Steve. That witch comes out that door, you don't look at her, just shoot. Right, boss.
Moving around the side of the building, he could miss the olive drab army surplus blanket hanging from the shattered window, and he understood. Steve clenched his teeth in rage and leered out into the darkness. You better run, bitch! But you ain't never gonna get away from me. I've seen you in your mind. I'll find you. I can always find you. But his words echoed in nothing but darkness. Violets had escaped. <laughs>